everybody, welcome back. Monday Morning Briefing, episode number 79. It's Friday, September the 23rd. We're gonna do this Monday video this week and get one in. Um, I didn't think I was gonna make it, but we got here this morning. We're gonna go ahead and knock it out real quick. Just kind of update you on a few of things we're working on. One of the things I did this week was uh, go ahead and make another pair of stirrups, an extra pair for that saddle that we did the time-lapse video of. That video has been doing really, really well, and I wanna thank everybody that's uh, watched that video and commented and stuff. It's, uh, it's doing really well for us it kind of surprised me I didn't know how well a video like that would do but it seemed like there was a there's a lot of people out there that just want to see the whole process in one shot um, and so it's doing real good maybe we'll do some more of those in the future but uh, the, the fellow that we sent that saddle to he's got three or four of ours um, he needed another pair of stirrups just for another saddle that he has and uh, he liked the tooling on that saddle so much he just said go ahead and do them just like I did on that saddle just put his initials on there so he went ahead and did that um, not something that I use and make a habit of doing I don't if you build saddles you probably you may or may not enjoy building stirrups I do not enjoy building stirrups we have done a video showing you how I build stirrups you can certainly go back and watch that it's an older video um, but they're just a, it's a lot of work that goes into a pair of stirrups and a lot of people don't understand how much work does go into those so usually if a customer is just hunting a pair of stirrups to put on a saddle, I always kind of send them to just a local tax store or order them online from like NRS or something like that um, and just, just order you a pair of stirrups because they're going to be much cheaper than paying me to build them. Um, and we just we usually only build stirrups for the saddles that we're working on. Speaking of saddles, this saddle behind me, as you can see, we've got the seat put in uh, yesterday. Actually, I got the seat put in. We've, it's a Mother Hubbard style. I'll show you some more up close of that saddle here in just a second. But um, we got those skirts on. I had to get uh, a little bit of help from a a good friend of mine and he kind of walked me through a few things i've never done one that's in skirt front and back rig before so that was interesting but we got it going and we got the seat in it so that saddle ought to be wrapped up hopefully next week we should be done with it but one of the main things that i've been working on the last week or so uh, we mentioned it the last time in the monday video but i was trying to design a weekender bag and, and this is what where we're at so far on it it's not Perfect, I don't know that our final video and our final pattern pack and everything for our Weekender design is going to be this particular bag. It may change a little bit just because of the construction um, ideas and the design that I had are a little bit complicated. And so anytime you design something, you in your mind it seems like it's gonna go pretty well and then you actually get to designing it and you see areas you could have improved or made it much easier to build. But this is kind of what we've what we've come up with so far, it's gonna be a functional bag. It's gonna be a, a, a neat bag. I'll probably just keep it for myself um, and, and use it um, and just kind of see how everything works out. Not everything fit exactly the way I wanted it and that's the part of design that a lot of customers, a lot of people and don't don't really see is that back end work. You've been there, you've, you've designed projects where you, you get halfway through them and figure out you, you messed something up or, or you didn't you know have everything just exactly the way you wanted it. So you do reiterations of it so you continue to build them and it may take three or four to get it really dialed in to where it works efficiently and so i really like this bag i like the size of it i like the design of it a lot of people have asked um, had a few emails come in like hey on that weekender bag you're designing is it going to fit the carry-on measurements or dimensions for you know flying when you go flying how, how, your bag has to be can't be over a certain size, I guess, for carry-on. I don't fly a lot, so I don't really know what those measurements are, but this bag is roughly 20 inches long by uh, figure, figure 12 inches wide, and then roughly about 12 inches deep total overall, um, 11 inches deep, somewhere around there. So you can kind of research that. It'll, the, the finished bag, the finished project video, when we get that done and everything and the patterns, it will be around this size um, because I'm making this bag for a good customer of mine and that's the size that he requested and I think it's a good size. It's just enough to hold just enough stuff for a night or two out and that way you can kind of fit your stuff but you don't have a big huge suitcase to take with you. But all in all, I'm pretty happy with the way the bag's going together. One of the things, just to kind of go over some of my concerns with this particular bag, is that I decided to do bound edges on this. All the bound edges on this bag went really well, uh, especially on these front pockets. Um, like these front pockets right here, the binding went on really well. Around this side, it went on okay. I've got a few bobbles. But when it came to this side, I really had 
some trouble. Um, I think I was trying to stitch too close to the edge, and so it was, and I was just hand holding that that binding as well I'm sewing, which makes it very difficult. So it's got some gaps in it. Not the optimal way to put on edge binding. Um, I, I've kind of come to the conclusion that if you're going to do edge binding and do it efficiently and do it well, you really need to have an adapter for the machine that is made to put edge binding on things so it'll feed that binding material in as you're sewing and it keeps it tight and puts it in the perfect spot so that that machine can sew that. Um, I have yet to find one um, that will fit my machine just yet. I'm sure there's one out there but I haven't done a ton of research. I'm just trying to get through this project. So on the, the actual finished bag we may try to do this with just a welting in there like we did on the kidney bean purse. It would be much easier I think. Um, than trying to do the edge binding. That might be something a little little too difficult for, for most people that are trying to build this bag because it was really hard for me um, to get it that far and then have so much trouble trying to get that edge binding on correctly. And I think it's just because of the size of the bag and the material, it's got some temper to it, but it was actually just a little bit squishy, I guess, every, as you'd sew it, push that binding out, and so it caused a little bit of issues. But all in all, I like the design of the bag, so that's that's where we're at on the Weekender bag right now. Um, it'll have a zipper piece that we'll sew in today, and uh, that'll kind of finish off the bag itself, and then we'll make a couple handles, and then also a shoulder strap. So uh, we'll see, we'll see how it finishes up. I'll probably post some pictures of that today. Um, when I get, get it kind of a little bit further along, get it done, we'll post some pictures of that and let you see that. Um, other things I've been working on, uh, last weekend I went and bought a bunch of plywood. I'm, I'm in an organizing mode in the shop, as some of y'all may have heard me say or, or seen on, on Instagram or something. I may have mentioned it to some of y'all all over the phone that have called. Um, I'm just trying to, to organize the chaos in here and try to get the shop a little bit more efficient just because we've been doing so many projects, so many videos, I'm tired of hunting down tools or hunting down supplies or whatever and everything's kind of just in disarray. So um, I do this usually once every couple of years. I kind of get in that mode where it's just I've had enough. We've got to clean the shop and organize. So that's what we've been working on and I went and bought a bunch of plywood and I'm actually, I'm not a woodworker, I'm not a cabinet maker, but I've got to figure out some way to store dyes in the cut room, scrap leather in the cut room, and that kind of deal. So we're playing with that, building some boxes, building some drawers, um, and just trying to make use of the empty spaces underneath a lot of these benches that's just kind of wasted. Um, and I'd get tired of using just cardboard boxes because cardboard boxes break down. They don't look very attractive you know, in the shop. Um, and, and the leather, especially heavy skirting leather, just tears the boxes, breaks them down over time. So they're not the optimal choice for long-term long storage of leather scraps and things like that. So we're just trying to work on that, kind of get it a little bit more efficient, a little nicer, cleaner. Um, it, it makes it a lot more joyful to go in there and into the cut room when it's kind of organized and you can find the three, four ounce scrap piece that you need to cut this one thing out of without having to dig through a box of just disorganized scraps and trying to find things. So let me grab the camera and I'm gonna take you back there and show you that and then I'll talk about this saddle just a little bit. Okay, so we talked about this, I think, in the last Monday video, but we got these tall racks here. Um, went ahead and kind of got skirt heavy skirting down there on the bottom and then some 910 up here on top and then just kind of right now just some assorted leathers there at the bottom um, and you can see my big old stack of plywood over there that we're still working on um, and then up on this shelf here I've kind of taken a lot of the scraps as far as just old tan scraps my goat skins uh, exotics uh, sorted chap leathers things like that and put them in totes and uh, labeled them so that I know what's in there. That's just gonna keep that leather a lot cleaner. That's another thing with boxes on the floor or under benches, they collect a lot of dust and just they get filthy and then it, you don't even wanna go in that box and look because you're not sure what's in there. So just trying to get that a little bit more organized because we do have a lot of scraps that we can put to use. Um, and then this big cut table, this has been kind of a nightmare since we built it just because that center shelf that was in there was just a collect all, a catch all of just junk. Um, you couldn't even really put rolled leather in there a lot of times because there's too much other scrap pieces and things. So what I did was I dropped that shelf all the way to the floor um, and then 
kind of built some dividers in there. Again, I'm not a cabinet maker, so critique away, but I'm sure I made some mistakes, but I'm having fun learning, just kind of the easier way of doing this. But I'm gonna put drawers along the bottom, those will hold scrap leather, and then some drawers here at the top that'll have some dividers in it to just hold different tools, maybe uh, finished cut pieces, just to keep Claudia kind of filled up with some of the material packs and things. So as I'm cutting scraps, I can kind of keep those sorted if I want to cut zipper pieces or purse parts or whatever. And they'll be in a drawer protected from the lights because a lot of your lighting, that's going to be one of the big issues is light damage um, from your lights in your shop. So anytime you can keep them in a in a box or something like that. Um, Claudia had a question on a lot of these leather, leathers. We use a lot of the clear plastic boxes. And she said, is that going to affect it? So with, with veg tan, yes, maybe, but I think it's better than nothing. And I prefer the clear boxes because I can kind of, at a quick glance, kind of see without having to read the label, kind of what's in there. And then I can go from there. Um, <clears throat> on this side here, we did the same thing. I did two very large boxes on the bottom, or drawers really. Um, again, I'm learning this, so I bought some the heaviest drawer slides that they had at the hardware store, and I think they're rated for 100 pounds. And like for these smaller drawers, worked out really nice. And so we've got a drawer here for just all our little dies, um, just saddle part dies, wallet dies, uh, knife sheath dies, things like that. And that drawer really works well. I was real happy with that one. And then this one here I did for our longer dies. So we've got guitar strap, uh, purse, gusset, your um, gun slings, things like that, larger dies, saddle dies, I've got those in there. Um, and I'm sure that'll change and we'll add to and that kind of thing as we go along. But now my dies are in a nice drawer where they're out of the, the element, so to speak. I know we're in a shop, but this roof does have a pinhole here and there where they miss shot a screw or whatever. And particularly right here on this cut bench, um, it leaks right about there. And if we get a big rain, which unfortunately we haven't had a lot of rain this year, but when we do, um, I've made the mistake of having some dyes sitting here come in over the weekend. We caught some rain and the water dripped on those dyes and they've actually kind of had some surface rust that we've had to take care of. And so this way, I was storing them just on this little shelf, but over the year, all the dyes we've had made, they don't fit there anymore. And I don't want to clutter the top of this bench with dies. So now we've got a place for those. This drawer here, um, I made it with a divider in there. And so basically on the left hand side, I've got nine, 10 scraps. If they fit in there, they go in there. If they don't, they go on a shelf or somewhere else, or I'm going to put that the bigger pieces. But for now, these are all nice small scraps. These are three, four ounce veg. So that way, if I'm at this clicker and I'm wanting to just kind of work up scraps or just cut a bunch of stuff or put throw some stuff on the cut bench page, which we are working on um, today and tomorrow as well, because we've got some stuff we need to put on there. Um, as we're doing that, I can go through these boxes and I know this leather is going to be good. It's protected from the light when that door is shut or when that drawer is shut. And um, it's not going to get any kind of dust or anything on it like that. You've got to remember veg tans like a sponge. And so if you're not kind of keeping it out of the weather, so to speak, it can cause some issues. Um, again, on these drawer pulls or drawer slides, they're rated for 100 pounds. These are very large drawers. Um, this one's not so bad. This one here is my intentions was heavy skirting and this drawer is really heavy and it's not full yet, but these are big thick pieces of skirting leather. So you can see how thick that is. And there's a bunch of scraps in there, which I like to keep because I can cut all small saddle parts out of ground seat pieces out of whatever I need. Um, I can even cut wallet material out of this and pull it down on the splitter if I need to. But this drawer, um, some of the drawer slides, I can already see them kind of stressing. And this drawer's only been in here about, well, since Sunday. So um, we may have to rethink that as far as what drawer pulls to use there. Um, but like I said, as I'm learning to do any kind of cowboy cabinetry, that's part of the learning process. So I'm not too, too critical on it. I don't really care so much about how it looks. I do like how this looks a lot better. Um, when you walk up to this bench, it's not just a bunch of scrap leather hanging out over the shelf and it looks all cluttered. Now it's all put up, it's clean, it's out of the light. That is the main issue with veg tan is keeping it out of the light as much as possible. Because remember, light will stain that veg tan leather and change the color of it. And so anytime you can get it kind of 
um, in, in a protected area where it's not getting a lot of light pollution, you'll be a lot better off. Um, and then, like I said, best way to store your full sides is just nice and flat. A lot of that curl will come out of them from being rolled up. Um, as you can see up here, this is a newer one we just rolled out the other day, and it's still got quite a bit of curl there in the, there in the neck. But over time, that'll begin to flatten out if we don't cut it up before then. But laying flat, also, you're a lot less apt to get light damage. Um, you may get some around the edges a little bit here and there, but it's not too bad. But anyway, that's kind of what we're working on back here. And just kind of right now I'm in leather and hardware organization mode. I'm kind of doing it by categories. So I'm doing leather, trying to get all the leather kind of put up where it needs to be. Like I said, this is really nice that I have all those little scraps. Some of this stuff, I'd say probably 60% of this stuff I didn't even know I had because it was in the bottom of just a assorted box. And so this makes it a lot nicer to be able to kind of just go, okay, I need this, I need that, I know where to go to find it. Um, this will be the next area here that we kind of attack. And as you can see how cluttered that looks. Um, and honestly, it's always looked like that. No matter where I was, whatever shop I was in, I always had a shelf or an area that looked just like this. When I was in Wheelock, it was all in a closet, which actually worked out really, really nice, but I could close that closet door if we had guests come in, or if we were just cleaning the shop and I didn't want to look at it, I could close the door and it all looked, the shop looked clean and organized, but the actual closet looked about like this, just really unorganized. So, but that's what we're working on. Just trying to get everything kind of more efficient, better use of our spaces, um, using smaller, you know, spaces and, and more efficiently and not just throwing stuff around in, in cardboard boxes. Okay, now as far as this saddle, as you can see, this saddle here, we're gonna start putting a ground seat in it today. I've just been camped out on some wrap up projects on some little things. I've got a bunch of belts I need to get knocked out too, but this one, we'll get a ground seat in it, um, hopefully today, and that way we can get it moving forward. That saddle there will be a, a quarter to a half breed floral. It's gonna be really, really neat looking little saddle. Um, but this one is a quarter breed. Um, you've seen this one on Instagram. We've posted quite a few pictures, but it is a what we call a mother hubbard so it's a in skirt rig front and back as you can see there the front rig and the back rig are in skirt and so the uh there there is not going to be any housings on this saddle that was my first one to do like that i've never really done a a true mother hubbard like that where there is no back housing and you know everything else so like i said i had a good friend of mine kind of walk me through some tips and give me some advice and uh it was challenging. I uh, honestly didn't think I was gonna get the skirts on it once I got them actually built, um, but it was, they went on finally, um, and I learned some stuff and little tricks on maybe getting them, getting them to move on there a little bit easier next time. The one thing that's crucial on these that I've kind of figured is that you've gotta cut, if you're doing the boot where your tree goes in the, into the skirt, you've gotta be sure that you cut this correctly so that when you put it on, you don't have any kind of gap back here against the cannel when you're doing a set of housings or rear jockeys it's easy to take those off and trim and kind of you know really fine tune them and keep putting them on till you get them just right where they're nice and snug up there um, with this type of design you don't have a lot it's a lot more work to take the skirts off and do any kind of trimming so you want to be sure and get that right from the start so that you can only so that you put them on one time and they're where you want want them to be back here um, like I said, this is my first one to do this way. Um, I feel like it's pretty well where I want it and I'm pretty happy with it. And so I'm excited to get this seat, let it dry and do our final cut on that and get those lines cut. And we ought to be able to wrap this saddle up. I think it's gonna be pretty. We are gonna tool the swells on this um, and the stirrups as well in the candle binder. So we'll, we'll be posting pictures of that on Instagram so you can certainly check that out. But that's where we're at on that saddle. All right, guys, so that's a little bit of what we've been kind of working on in the shop. We did, we are doing some podcast interviews, getting some of those back into the pipeline, so we should be back up and running. We will have a podcast episode come out next week, and um, I think it was a great interview. It was really interesting. It was somebody I met at Waco. I'd met him before, but never really visited with him a bunch, and uh, it was just, it was really entertaining to kind of visit with him and hear his story, and uh, I'm sure you'll, if you've been in leather work for quite some time, maybe taking some classes, you'll have heard of him, and um, he's just a really unique guy. 
and has a cool story. So we had a great interview. Um, that one will be out next Thursday, and then we've got more lined up, more interviews we're doing. I appreciate you guys sending me um, kind of your recommendations of people I may or may not have heard of. Um, we are putting those on a list. We have a, a really large list of, of potential interviews that we want to do with people. It's just a matter of getting to them. So if you've got somebody, feel free to email us or give us a shout at the shop and uh, give us some information on them. We'll do a little research and put them on the list and see if we can get them get them on the show at some point. Um, if you don't know about Lost Trade, it's uh, you can go to Apple or Spotify, search Lost Trade Podcast. You can find that. We've got 38 or 39 episodes, I believe, um, on there of great craftsmen, uh, men and women that are, that are doing great things from hat making to boot making. Um, you know, um, I think we've got some silversmiths on there, uh, spur makers, bit makers. Um, there's just a lot of different crafts having to do with Western lifestyle trades that we want to talk to. And uh, it's just great listening, especially if you're in the shop, you know, you can kind of hear other people and how they kind of run their business and some of the challenges that they deal with um, because we're all kind of in this together. We all have the same kind of challenges and, and wins and that kind of thing. So it's good to listen to those guys and, and uh, hear what those folks have to say about, um, about their businesses and what they're doing. But that's about all I got for you this week. I'm going to go ahead and get off of here and get back to work. We're going to try to finish up this bag and then dial in our patterns and hopefully we can get this one going. Got some smaller project videos that we're working on as well and also some tip videos. So I really appreciate you guys. Be sure to go to dgsalary.com and sign up for the Leathercraft newsletter if you haven't already. And we'll see you all next week in the Monday morning briefing.